I promised you last time that we were going to take a look at .NET Aspire, but actually I've decided before we get on to that, I wanted to make a few changes to the existing application, particularly in terms of adding logging, because that's one of the things that Aspire really helps us with and we will be able to see the improvements. The other thing though I wanted to add, slightly related to logging, is introducing Swagger, because as you may have noticed, Swagger has disappeared apparently with the arrival of .NET 9, so I'm going to talk briefly about why that is and also how we can get it back in there. So let's just take a look at the application we're dealing with. And remember what we had, we've got this simple application, we've got a Blazor WebAssembly client, we've then got this Blazor pre-rendering, which is the host for that client, and then we've got the API. And when we run this up, then it starts up both the back end and the front end, and we can see here we've got the WebAssembly and it's just fetching some of that data through from the API. And so the structure we had, remember we'd used the reverse proxy YARP so that actually the WebAssembly always talks to the hosting server and then the hosting server forwards those requests through the reverse proxy to the actual API. And let's say first thing I want to do in that is add some logging. And so just go into here where we've got our API service and just put in some logging so that we can see whenever a request is made for books or authors. So simply enough to do, we're going to put in a private, read only, and then it's going to be an I logger. And the way we use these loggers is we make them generic for the class that we're actually trying to do the logging from, so our API service in this case. And all that does is sets up the logger so that it will log using API service as the name of the source for the logging. So it's just really a way of putting the appropriate name in there, nothing fancier than that, but it's quite handy. And so we can just add that into the constructor. So now we've got that there. And then very simple, just in the get authors, we'll just let the IA generate that. So get authors was called. And similarly in the get books, we can let the AI do the work for us. And so we've got the logging in there. So that's logged when we make the requests. But what we also like to do is log on the API when we receive those requests. And that's all done in here in program because it's a minimal API. Let's just do a bit of tidying up. Actually, I commented out those calls stuff last time. We can get rid of it completely because we saw last time that we don't need that. But you can see here we've got the two endpoints for books and authors. Now, we could obviously do the logging in the same way. Just do iLogger generic for something like we had over here with iLogger generic for API service. But that's not entirely sensible here because the class that we're in here actually for a minimal API is just the program class. And I don't think it's very useful to have logs that say they come from the program because it doesn't really specify where they're from. So we do things slightly different here. We don't inject an iLogger, we inject an iLogger factory. And we'll just call that logger factory, simple enough. And then that means we can create a logger with whatever name we choose rather than the generic version which takes the name off the class. So what we can then do in here is simply log a factory and then you can see again the AI is helping us. So we're going to create a logger, it's calling it books and then it's logging get books called. I don't want to call it books, I'm just going to call this minimal API but up to you what you want to call it but we can see we've got complete control there. And then if we do the same sort of thing in the author's endpoint and then we can just pop that in there. And I don't really like it being called get books actually because it's not the name of the method, it's the get verb on the author's endpoint. So let's say get four authors called, just a little bit clearer, I think, and we'll change that to books. As ever, never really trust the AI, always check what it's doing and make sure it makes sense. But there we've got those two bits of logging. So we've done the logging on the API and we've done the logging on the front end. So if we now run that up, then we should be able to see that. So we can see here is the console that we've got for the API. And so you can see the get for books called the get for authors called because they're both called on that page. The logging for the front end actually goes into the browser console. So if we get that over there, now remember at the moment we don't make a direct call until we go there and then come back. But now we can see that in amongst the other things we've got there, there we've got the get to authors called there we've got the get books called, so that's the logging happening in there. There's one other bit of logging that we have, which is the logging from the reverse proxy. So if I just drag over the other console, so this is for the hosting server, then you can see where it's done the forwarding for the authors and the books. So forwarding them from port 7135 
which is where that's being hosted, to the API, which is on 7108. So we can see three levels of logging. We can see logging in the browser for the WebAssembly, logging on the hosting server for the forwarding, and logging on the API server when we actually get the request. So that's quite a bit of logging done. But just as a kind of indication of why using Aspire is so nice, we can see it is getting a bit messy to be having to look in all these different places to get the different logs, and you've got so many console windows and that sort of thing. But we've got the logging in there. The other thing that I wanted to do was put Swagger in there because something that you may have noticed is that as of .NET 9, we no longer get Swagger built in. So if I just do a new project here quickly, and let's just go for a Web API project, click Next on that. Let's just leave that name as whatever it is. And if I have that as .NET 8, you can see we've got the enable open API support. If I go to .NET 9, well, actually, it's still doing the same thing, but it's doing it in a slightly different way. Let's go back to .NET 8 and create that. And we can see that in the program, what it's done is it's done this add Swagger Gen there, and then it's done the use Swagger and the use Swagger UI. But if we go back to what we had on our API project, which we've got here, and which is .NET 9, then on that one, it's just done this slightly different map open API, so not the add swagger gen, and then there's nothing in the rest of it to display anything. If we go and run this, we'll see exactly what Swagger's doing. It's doing a couple of things. So there we've got Swagger, but the two things it's doing, we've got this file called swagger.json, and if we click on that, that just gives us a JSON file that has all the information about the endpoints and things like that. So just out of the box, we've got the slash weather forecast with a get verb. So that's what's going on there. So that's being generated. And then also what's being generated at swagger slash index.html is basically a JavaScript application that reads that swagger.json and then generates the GUI that we can see here that allows us to try it out and that sort of thing. So that's what we had up until .NET 8, but then that doesn't happen anymore in .NET 9. In .NET 9, we simply, as we saw, get this map open API, and that does just effectively one half of those two tasks. It generates the JSON file, but doesn't do anything in terms of giving you the front end. So if we run this up, and then go to the endpoint. Remember, this one is on 7108, and you can see I've already been doing this, but the default, it just goes to slash open API slash v1.json, and so there you can see the equivalent of that JSON file, so you can see our endpoints books and authors and the data types and other things like that as well. So it's doing the same sort of thing, but only generating the data, not generating as the front end. Now, the reason that Microsoft have dropped Swagger from the template, that's all they've done, it's just no longer included in the template when we create a brand new application, is because they say it's gone out of active support, and they're, so they're concerned in the long run whether it'll be fully supported. There are several alternatives that do the same sort of job as Swagger, some of them rather better, and in a future video we may take a look at those, but for now I'll just show you how you can reintroduce Swagger and so everything can be working fine, because it really is pretty easy. So let's go to our API application and just pop on another NuGet package. And the NuGet package we want is simply one called Swashbuckle. And then of the various ones we're being shown there, we just want swashbuckle.spnet core. So that's the one that's included or was included in the template before .NET 9. So we'll put that in there. And then we just put in those bits of code that we had before. So if you can't remember them, they're actually quite easy to copy and paste. So if we just go back to this one here, we need to do the add swagger gen. So that goes in the program instead of the add open API. And then we have to put the use swagger and the use swagger UI. Don't have to put them in the is development, but we can do that. So let's pop that in there. And that will now give us our swagger. So really simple to add that back in. So it's not a huge loss that it's not in the template. The other thing we need to do is just change the startup so we can display that. So if we go into launch settings and then what we simply need to do is on the HTTPS profile, we're gonna change launch browser to true and then also give it a specific launch URL so that it knows to launch swagger because that's a slightly different endpoint for everything else. And now if we run that, 
we can see that it's now launching the Swagger, and so now we've got the API and we can try it out for all the things that we've got there and we can get hold of our books. But notice, and you've got to be careful of the numbers here, this one is on 7108. So that's the actual API server which is generating the swagger. But remember when we take a look at the Blazor application, that's on 7135. And remember it's making its request back to 7135 and then 7135 is forwarding it to 7108 as the actual API. So what we'd like to be able to do, you might think, is similarly to having the ability to just go to Swagger on there, doesn't really need the index because that's the default, so it will just go there with Swagger and add the index on the end, but we'd like to be able to, on here, put Swagger and, well, you can see it doesn't like that at all. It's just said it failed to load that because it looks at 7135 and doesn't get what we wanted. So what we need to do is we need to get that to forward the swagger definition along with everything else. And that's actually pretty easy. So what we've got to do there is go to our app settings dot development on the hosting server. So that one there, which remember is where we had set up our reverse proxy so that anything coming in on API slash was forwarded to the API cluster and that's what we had in there. What we've got to do with that is also add another route to say that the swagger calls have to be forwarded as well. And so all we can do is we will get hold of that API route and copy it down there, giving us a warning because it's duplicated, but let's change this and call it swagger route and then it's going to use the same cluster because it's actually using the same address for the endpoint, so that one's fine. But then the path we're going to match is going to be simply slash swagger slash any. So that's what we've got on there. And then that really should handle everything. So now if we run that up, so we've got various things coming up. So that is the actual swagger for the API on 7108, you can see there, but also if we do a slash swagger on here, then you can see that although it looks like we're getting 7135, it's actually forwarding it through to 7108, the API, and giving us that back. So we didn't have to do any specific swagger configuration in the server that's doing the forwarding. It just forwards that and we get everything working there. And in fact, we can see that quite clearly because if we look at the logging once again and just do a quick refresh on that, then we can see that it's done two things. So there is where it's forwarded the request for the index.html, which remember is the JavaScript application that reads the data. So that's been forwarded and downloaded into the browser. But then as soon as that JavaScript runs, it makes the request for the swagger.json and we can see that that then again has been forwarded. So the hosting server is doing nothing at all except forwarding. And so all of that for Swagger, both the JavaScript application and the definitions in swagger.json are coming to us from the API and just being forwarded. So that's put everything together. We can see how easy it is to include logging either with iLogger or iLogger Factory. We've seen how we can add Swagger even though it's not there automatically. And lastly, we've seen how we can actually get at the Swagger even though we've got the reverse proxy because we can just configure it to send the Swagger information through as well. So that's quite a lot of stuff there. And we can see the problem that we've got or a problem we've got is we have got lots and lots of these logging windows and things like that. That's one of the problems we're going to solve. And I promise it will be next time when we look at Aspire. So if you're interested in that, do subscribe, do click the like button and I'll see you then.